Hi, how's it going? I'm really hoping you guys are going to enjoy this wagon as much as we've enjoyed building it. Um, really cool body style. You don't see many of these, you know. The reality is most of them got ridden hard and put away wet and kind of disregarded and forgotten about decades ago. But for us at Icon, we kind of like the freaks and the geeks, the underdogs, the forgotten models or years or body styles. And the early 50s wagons were kind of a really neat time in automotive American transportation like history. You know, the country was really starting to open up, the road systems were getting developed, so people were starting to hit the road and take family trips, and the need for wagons really, really grew. So the OEMs started to acknowledge that and develop more and more of them. This particular wagon was inspired by my wagon. So mine is a 52 Chrysler Town & Country wagon that I put a 52 DeSoto front clip on. So this client reached out and said, hey, I want one of those and I, I wouldn't sell him my wagon. So uh, we hunted down this car and built this one for him. Funny thing is actually, usually my hunters find all the cars, but in the case of this wagon, the client found it on Craigslist like pretty damn quickly and the body on it, epically clean really really cool 54 is interesting that still has the traditional DeSoto grill still has the same basic body shape that went back to 51 but it has the panoramic one-piece windshield that started in 53 specifically this wagon is a 1954 DeSoto power master you gotta love that name they were so much better at naming cars back in the day not to mention building them in my opinion so with this video, this being a special project, I'm going to bore you with details, so hang in there. Um, those of you that are uh, into what we do, though, I, I think it's kind of neat to go through the whole journey of the build. So, building a derelict. First struggle, finding the car. Finding the car that has that right balance of patina and funk, but that isn't a rusty tramp. So, success here found a really good body no drama no rust repair we did zero zero body work even the floors on it were in epic shape although we reshaped the trans tunnel to fit our modern tranny basically what we'll do find the car get it to the shop lift the body off of the frame lock the body in space and then we'll do varying degrees of digitizing that structure so it depends on the complexity of the vehicle and what data we may have that's relevant from previous projects. But it can be everything from a tape measure party to a flat PDF 2D to tri-top laser scanning the underside or full 360 degrees of the car. The goal is to get the car digitized so we can get it into CAD programs, mostly CATIA, to then engineer in SOLIDWORKS, to then engineer frame rails that will non-invasively attach to that stock body structure. Then we work through it with the client. We decide, are we doing four-wheel independent? Are we doing C7 front? Are we doing Morrison's independent? Are we doing four-link rear? Are we doing Panhard, three-bar, triangulator, whatever? Whatever fits the way the client's gonna use the vehicle and the dynamics of the limitations of packaging within the stock vehicle. So we'll digitally build that. Then we'll pick our favorite brake system. Then we'll work with various OEMs to get the CAD models of the engine choice, the tranny choice. Then do the wheels. The wheels we work with the guys at Billet Antiques, otherwise known as Circle Racing. Sometimes again, we'll scan the original wheel if the profile is unique to get it into CAD and then scale it up to usually 17s or 18s to fit the modern brake choices that we'll make. Then comes tires, then comes digitally kind of South Park Photoshop rendering the stance, get that all dialed in. Then minor finite analysis of scrub rate and turning radius and Ackerman angle. Pick the right steering rack ratio for the rack and pinion based on the diameter of the wheel and again the client's usage dynamics. Then when we think all oh, that's good, then I'll model the fuel tank design and the radiator. 
that's as far as we can go on these one-offs digitally. It's way farther, I think, than any other builder does, and it makes a big difference. But we can't get into exhausts or any of the other stuff, so we'll model the fuel system, for example, ideally to run the same factory fuel pump and level sender used by the engine choice that we make. If there's an availability issue or a packaging issue due to the tank dynamics, then sometimes we'll uh, use a aeromotive product instead, which is really good quality stuff anyway. So once that's all modeled, we think it's all gonna work out, then okay, sign off on that and then build the print. Once we build all that stuff, like Art Morrison does a chassis, everything's delivered and ready to rock, then we start the physical phase. Physical phase goes in two phases, or actually three. One, we take all those new parts and all the new engineering, build it on raw metal, no fluids, assemble it, fit the body on, make sure it all gets along, then hand build the exhaust system, again, leaving it raw. Then move on to the interior, so air conditioning, Bluetooth, audio, breakaway column, whatever functionality changes are needed, uh, reworking gauges, dash layout, stuff like that. Then pre-factor with our electrical engineer where the fuse panel is going to go, where the computer is going to go, uh, where pass-through junctions need to be on the firewall and stuff like that. Then stop. Ideally have the client come visit and sit his ass in the car or hers, make sure the ergonomics are all working out. Then boom, tear it apart. Now tear it apart, isolate the body from the chassis, then tear the chassis apart, down to nothing again, media blast everything, ceramic coat, polish, plate, paint, and powder coat, and then reassemble it one last time, this time with final torque check with wax crayons at every torque junction that the project manager will come and triple check. Then the body gets put on a specially made cart blown apart. So just the shell, all doors off, front clip off, bumpers, glass, everything obviously. Then we'll coat the underside after a strenuous clean out, dry, not wet clean. We'll polyurea coat the underside of the vehicle in a heat cured polyurea that acts as a rust inhibitor, vibration dampener, sound deadener. Then on the inside of the doors, the floors, the firewall, the quarters, and the roof, we'll line all that stuff in Dynamat. Then we start final Legos. So then that begins the third and final phase when everything's done, all the hinges are rebuilt, lock cylinders are new, weather stripping, glass as needed, and then all the way back together again, fluids in, turn the key, hope it worked out, and then start test driving. And that's where we are right now on this car. So more specifics about the choices made in this particular car. We chose the 6.1 Hemi SRT8 Fuelie. We chose the modern five-speed automatic from Mopar used in a billion applications. Not the Mag 1, but the, uh, I think it's the 545RFE, I think. Um, used by the SRT10 uh, monster pickup, so really nice and strong, durable tranny. In the front end, we're running Art Morrison's independent front, all tubular, TIG welded. We're running uh, four link in the rear, running Johnny joints for greater isolation and flex. And we're running a uh, Curry Strange 9 in the rear uh, with superior axles. I don't remember the gear ratio. I think this one's 389 because kind of a freeway flyer. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, rack and pinion column is an I did it. Uh, Scott and Ken at I did it kindly let us annoy them and get off menu to machine custom splines that will index the stock steering wheels onto the modern tilt safety breakaway column. The steering wheel is a money pit. It was beat to piss, it was just the metal ring and nothing else left. So we had to model it based on vintage sales brochures from DeSoto, create the mold, and then do the injection and cast the wheel brand new. Came out kick ass. This is kind of ivory, slightly translucent white, and it flows to the column. You'd never know the column wasn't stock. Um, on the column, we have. Uh, stainless steel tips and arms for tilt, 
gear shift. We did no gear shift indicator because they're kind of ugly and who needs it. We hit the electronic overdrive switch down low. The dash on this car is super cool. It just has a, a really nice flow to it. Um, one thing that's always kind of a fun challenge for us is to integrate all the modern functionality into these vintage dashes, right? So in this case, we got like a killer dash. Original design is beautiful. Really love these gauges. They're really unique. The indices are printed on the face of the dials and they're white and they're embossed. And then the background's kind of like a brushed argent. Then the needles are a high fluorescent orange. And then the numerals for speed and lettering for, you know, hot, cold, empty, full are actually printed on the back side of the acrylic crystal. So they've got like some cool depth to them. So we worked really hard to leave those as designed. All we did is clean them and then gut them. So Shannon at Redline, who's our gauge partner on most of our projects, he put all modern units, all modern motors, mostly VVO source, all electronic, behind the gauges to leave them looking original, but to give us the reliability and interface function we needed for the modern things. Like, there's no speedo cable uh, with this tranny. It's, it's a vehicle speed sensor. It's an electronic signal. Then for switches, we got lucky yet again because the number of stock switches in this dash happened to be an exact match for the number of switches we needed for our modern functions. So then we took all the original knobs and modified those on our mill to now index and function the modern switches. So again, behind the scene, reliable, modern, easy to support, um, switch gear but the aesthetic stayed dead stock so climate control those three switches remain stock and then headlights and wiper for wiper the entire system is gutted well obviously the whole electrical system is gutted it's all mil spec brand new crosslink wire uh busman fuse panel modern relays bosch blah 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 but for the uh wiper the stock wiper systems suck and you can rebuild them as many times as you want they're still going to suck so more and more we'll engineer a modern wiper system using a modern three-speed motor with delay and then improve the linkages improve the arms and improve the blades the best we can while still making sure the vibe stays vintage same with climate control decisions made by us with the client but in this case we decided to leave the dash as smooth as possible and not do modern vents. So we do these sort of defroster style thin louver vents for them under the dash to just shovel and flow the air up. And it works great with this Gen 4 heat vent AC system from Vintage Air. It pushes plenty of volume even for a big wagon like this. The rest of the interior is really dead stock um, pattern. I mean, well, like the layout and the trim and the seat frames. Um, we replaced all the foam with a closed cell Tempur-Pedic style foam. The audio system uh, is behind perforated leather in the four doors, so no visible speakers. Um, the audio system is a new product that we're testing on this car that I like, which goes through your smartphone via Bluetooth, and there's no visual controls on the vehicle. You, you pick your track or whatever through your phone. Solely the volume is done through the dash, and in that instance, we got the original volume knob on the factory AM radio and repurposed that with a dual pot potentiometer to control your audio volume. Uh, what else? Uh, we purposely wanted to have like a kitsch 50s fun like Southampton kind of beach vibe. So we worked with SMS to source this really cool vintage uh, wool. So once we found and, and, and chose this fabric with this kind of cream, yellow and green 
color palette. We then went to Moore and Gilles and picked a uh, aniline top grain Italian uh, leather uh, in two different shades of green that, that played well with that. Carpet, we wanted to disappear, so it's a simple chocolate brown. Headliner is a low maintenance vinyl, just nice and simple. So that's pretty much the whole story without getting too weedsy. I just love building these derelicts and I think of all the vehicles that we build, these are the ones creating the most memories. Maybe the 4 buys too, but there's something about a derelict that inspires you to use it. To go on that road trip, you know, hit the dirt road and not cringe. And the patina and the non-perfection of the exterior is really liberating because then you're free to use it. You're not freaking out about every first scratch or leaving it in the sun or the dirt road or getting to the beach or whatever. They just have so much personality and they exude a certain lightheartedness and, and friendly nature that makes them really appeal to a wide range of people. And you never see a derelict on the road and go, oh, look at that rich jerk. It's, it's not about the money. It's, it's about a design sense and a little bit of romance, a little bit of sense of history. And um, I don't know. I love them. And I'm honored to be able to call this a job. And the list... We have about four years of derelict projects lined up in the queue to build. They're wonderfully diverse. And, uh, I look forward to each and every one of them. So until next time, thank you again for watching one of my poorly produced commando style videos. Any questions, give us a call at 818-280-3333. Obviously the website is icon4x4.com. And Facebook, Jonathan Ward, Instagram, Icon Design.